but I, I'm a former teacher. I like class participation, so just ask questions, and you know, I uh, don't have, have anything too rigid planned today. So I just hope, uh, hope we can cover all the issues that you guys want to talk about. I've got plenty of time. William and I have another one of these in uh, Stockbridge at noon. So. Um, yeah, so yeah. I can probably outlast it. So, and Jeff, uh, Senator Jeff would be here too. I think I talked to him yesterday. I'm sure he'll make it at some point, but it's a little bit of a hall from here. But anyway, you said well, the you said the slide is from the state. Is I got the, uh, is the input from the Democrats and Republicans both? Or how is it? What are we watching for that? Yeah. Um, I think it was provided, or, or, or I think it was created by our speaker's office, so Speaker Voss. So he's a Republican. So I think it's hopefully somewhat neutral. At this point, I'm neutral regarding the budget. You know, there's a lot of items in there. There's a couple of policy things I really believe in. I don't believe that uh, um, non-budgetary items belong in the budget. Um, I, I think that's pork barreling, in my opinion. But um, shy of that particular perspective. Um, right now, just kind of, we'll talk about this in the future, but we're in the beginning parts of the budget process. We're kind of in the part of the process where we talk about what we want, what we don't want. Because, so, I also am an attorney and I do a lot of negotiations. And one of the most important things in any negotiation is for both sides to kind of put on the table what are our goals, what are we trying to get, and then we try to find common ground. Um, I think Governor Avers has done a nice job of explaining what he wants. Um, I don't know if I agree with what he wants, but he's made it clear to us this is what he's going for. Um, and uh, um, right now, I think it's kind of, right now, the Republican perspective of trying to find, well, what are the things that, that we can fit, and well, how much debt are we willing to tolerate increasing in our, you know, our state's budget. So that's kind of, I think, generally where we're at. And we've got Senator Andre Jack. Hey, Ron. Yeah, why don't you just come no, on in. I'm just showing you up there. Perfect. Yeah, just jump on, jump on in, and we're going to start the uh, PowerPoint. See how visible it is. Oh, that's pretty. Everybody see it okay? It looks pretty good to me. All right. So, yeah, Governor Evers budget. So, the point of that is, is that the budget we're talking about today is not the budget that joint finance is going to agree on. So joint finance is called joint finance for a reason. It's Assembly and Senate, and it's Republican and Democrat. So, it's basically a group effort to try to create our budget. Um, and that's the budget that I'm likely to vote on. This budget is not what... Hey, Danny. Uh, this is... Uh, not the budget that we're likely to vote on. This is kind of his proposal of what he thinks joint finance should pass. So that's kind of where we're, we're at, you know, in a nutshell. So. so I'll always try to make it a point of not reading PowerPoints because I know you guys can read. <laughs> that's kind of a bad, uh, a, a bad uh, uh, strategy. So maybe I'll just give you guys a second to read, read the PowerPoint before I start talking over your reading. probably caught up at some point. So one of the things I want to tell you about is an experience that I have that you don't have that I hope you'll be proud of. So one of the things I've noticed kind of in the Wisconsin mentality is, is we're not real great at patting ourselves on our, back, on our back. We're very good at saying, okay, we've done this, what's next? And I think we're very aggressive when it comes to trying to make our state better. And I think that's a really cool perspective. I think that's great. But when I go to, uh, so we go to you know, NCLS, so National Conference of State Legislatures, state legislatures and uh, different groups where different legislators talk to each other, talk about ideas that work well for us, things that we wish we wouldn't have done, you know, how different fiscal houses are in order. And it's really fun to be from Wisconsin and go to those because generally the uh, national groups will use Wisconsin as a model of good fiscal responsibility. Most other states are not nearly in the fiscal place that Wisconsin's in. And it's it's fun to be the state that made the right decisions and is not in a fiscal place in a state like Illinois, which is usually kind of the 
don't do that, do Wisconsin model type of a uh, uh, experience. So uh, that's kind of my perspective. Uh, Andre, uh, so is there anything you want to well, I, I would certainly echo what you just said in terms of, I believe we're one of uh, a couple states in the country that uh, on the pension system uh, essentially have our, our liabilities fully funded, and uh, that's certainly something to be proud of and to sustain. Uh, what Ron said before in terms of, you know, yes, the governor proposed his, uh, his budget. Uh, it was introduced in that form, uh, which is the, the system that we have. But uh, two years ago, uh, Governor Walker did the same thing, proposed his initial thoughts for the budget, and then we kind of started over building it from, uh, from the base. And I think a really important thing to really differentiate Wisconsin from the national level is, of course, we hear all about shutdowns or continuing resolutions. At the you know, different portions of the, the federal budget uh, can actually shut down um, and other parts continue. In Wisconsin, if we don't have resolution on the budget, which many times, regardless of which party or if there's complete control or not, going back decades now, it doesn't get done right on time, and it could take a lot longer uh, this time. But the important thing is that uh, we really continue our current budget uh, at level of expenditures uh, in the, the period that we don't have any new budget agreed to. And in Wisconsin, we've been in the black. We have a surplus right now. So it would be a, a bigger concern if we were in the red and you're potentially causing a, a greater deficit to have to build a budget repair bill on later. But uh, in this case, um, you know, we're in a position of, you know, based on past decisions, being able to look at where we, where do we invest resources and how do we best you know, help the, the greatest number of folks in terms of our, our tax structure, our schools, our roads, and everything else that's really important to the states. Yeah, one of the big things that, one of the reasons why we have a surplus instead of deficits like a lot of other states isn't just the spending that we're, you know, doing or they're doing, it has a lot to do with interest. So we don't have a great amount of debt that we're paying off on interest. So if we were paying a, a substantial amount, like for example, I think the federal government is like 24% or something your tax dollars goes just to the interest on the loans that they've taken. We don't have a big 24% cut like uh, the federal government does out of your tax dollars at the state level. So that's a huge advantage for us taxpayers because we're actually seeing our money go towards something we believe in um, uh, in, in, instead of it going to like an interest or that thing. Our, our budget is required to balance unlike the federal government which is allowed to yeah. Put it on the credit card and print, print money. So a lot of states don't have an opportunity anymore. They're so deep in the hole that they can't ever do the Wisconsin model. But the states that are close, it's kind of it seems to me a no-brainer that they should be adopting some of the policies that work here. Because and that's kind of what the national level tells the other states is do what Wisconsin does, and you know you can have your cake and eat it too. And if revenue, I mean. Certainly, the, the budget is based on projections in terms of revenue that's going to come in from tax collections. Um, but if those projections are off from what we really see, then we have statutory triggers in terms of when the legislature would need to step in and do a budget repair bill so that things don't get too far out of whack. And we do have uh, a lot of legislators that look at um, the level of expenditures between the first and the second year, the biennium, and, where that, that base is going to come at and, and how we're hopefully not creating too great of a structural deficit. Yeah. We've also taken fiscal disorder when it's come to our state. Uh, we've taken responsibility and fixed those issues in the past. Um, and if they aren't fixed, they become big topics that we've talked about. For example, the transportation fund that we have that's separate from our general fund. That's a topic that I think probably most of you have already heard about you're already concerned about. The fact that you are concerned about it is kind of what I'm talking about in that we're taking those issues seriously where other states, unfortunately, a lot of times do not, and then, you know, the issue will move. But I saw one question. Yeah. Uh, you say that as of today, we have almost $700 million surplus. Right. So how come for the last eight years when we borrowed hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for roads, and we already had a surplus and just keep kicking the can because we're going to be paying for interest and everything else for so many years. Mm -hmm. My kid will be paying on that. Bloody Lord. 
So how come if we have a surplus, are we borrowing so much millions of dollars that Walker says we didn't have? Well, um, I'd probably be in the same boat as you, or I wish we wouldn't have borrowed some money. Um, but uh, some, it was um, a lot. Yeah. So we have a seventy-six billion dollar budget. So in perspective, I mean, seven hundred million dollars isn't necessarily going to fix. You know, it's not enough to necessarily fix all of the issues that we've had. And our surpluses in the past that we've known we were going to get or we've already have, we've spent. We haven't, you know, uh, put them in, you know, a different account or that kind of thing. Other than we have uh, one of the best rainy day funds in, in the country, to shy of that, uh, that I think we have the best uh, rainy day fund um, in the country. But, um, you know, regarding kind of that debt and that deficit, it has a lot to do with separate funds. So in 2009, uh, we had basically some money that was set aside for the trans You know, Andre probably explain that better because he was in the legislature. Well, you know, it, it's one of those things where, you know, I think certainly there's bipartisan concern over the level of bonding. Uh, actually, I believe the overall level of bonding went down in the previous state budget, but that was when you look at the capital budget and all things combined. But, I, I mean, I think transportation, one of the issues that we've had is that we have really five major components that make up the expenditures of the state budget, and certainly there are a lot of other significant things that we do, but between K-12, the university system, corrections, health care, and transportation, um, those priorities are all kind of competing for the same resources. And when you come to an area like transportation where there has not been agreement between the legislature and the governor or the legislature, both branches, um, it's something where that gets kicked to the end of the discussion when there isn't any money left. And, and so bonding has been usually where they get to in terms of uh, the amount of need that you know, is, is determined. But, um, the transportation fund is a separate fund from our general fund. Well, and that's, and that's very important because obviously uh, you all voted on a state constitutional amendment just a, a few years back to really securitize, to, to keep those funds segregated, lockboxed essentially, because we did have a couple consecutive budgets of raiding the transportation fund and putting that money into K-12, into some of those other large areas. And um, so now I, I think we have a little bit more uh, peace of mind that if we are putting money into the transportation fund, that's where it's gonna stay. And uh, I think that's certainly important to a lot of legislators who are looking not only at uh, you know, the cost side of the equation, but you know, new revenues and making sure that we're, we're spending them in the right way. And uh, you know, if we put money from GPR into the transportation fund, uh, it's going to be built into the base. It's not going to be able to be, be stripped out. Good question. Does anybody else have any other questions before we go on to the next slide? Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So this is a little bit what I was talking about prior to us starting. I'll repeat again because a couple new uh, folks came in. Uh, but we're pretty early on in the budget process. So the budget process is, and it was the same with uh, Governor Walker, uh, is the budget is proposed by the governor. It's kind of the governor telling the legislature, these are the things that I'd like you guys to do. Um, and then we have uh, listening sessions like this where we go to our own constituents, ask our constituents what are they interested in, what's important to them, what's not other processes to get information as well uh, from uh, our constituents uh, and then we input those information to enter that information into budget motions my office will have a certain number of budget motions if your Andre's office will have budget motions as well we provide those budget motions to joint finance and what joint finance so what joint finance is is it's, an, it's a committee that has assembly and senator me or has assembly members and senate members and Republican and Democrat and that body basically tries to um, determine a budget of picking what are our priorities, what's most important, what's least important, and the information that my office provides tells them what do I think is most important for the third assembly district. Um, so that's kind of the process is they're kind of in this information collecting stage right now where they're trying to figure out what are all the things we could spend this $76 billion budget on. And then um, at that point though, um, have countless numbers of hearings uh, throughout uh, this spring and then probably early June and then they'll have a product 
sometime in around June, July, August, sometime during the summer, where they'll say, okay, this is what joint finance thinks our budget should be. And then that can be amended after that. Um, but generally, that's, that's a pretty good sense of what I'll actually be voting on. At this point, we're just kind of in this info information collecting stage where we're just trying to get information together uh, so that we can kind of make our decisions and at least tell the joint finance our preferences. And then internally, just kind of maybe for your curiosity sake, if you have some uh, regarding this, is uh, while I'm not on uh, joint finance, um, what I can do is I can communicate with one person individually in that joint finance group, and kind of that's my go-to person uh, that I ask for, um, and I kind of advocate for the third assembly district too. Um, for me, uh, our local person that's in joint finance is Mike Orkast. He's my, we call him budget buddies, but he's the individual that I, I go to and advocate for, you know, things that are important to our district. For example, one of the most important things that I'm asking for that's specifically good for our district, and I hope Andre will ask for this too, I don't know if we'll talk about this personally, but uh, is another judge for Calumet County. So, you know, maybe not the biggest focus in Kimberly right now, but last year my biggest ask was uh, regarding a TIP district with the new page site. And that was one of the hardest things I think we were able to accomplish last year. Uh, it was a very divisive issue, uh, but eventually we did end up carrying the day and uh, 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 Danielle is here, our village administrator, so uh, uh, she can uh, comment on that too uh, uh, at some point if she'd like. So, but she's busy being mom. I'm a, I'm a new dad, so I love that time too. So. Uh, but anyway, Andre? Well, I completely agree with you on the county judgeship. Actually, uh, Ron is uh, uh, one of the co-authors of it. So uh, we have legislation standalone based on uh, the chief judges of the entire state have recommended 12 additional circuit court branches to be added. Uh, another one happens to also be in my district in Manitowoc County, but they have had a continuous caseload analysis. Uh, originally, it was uh, 190 judgeships were created back in, uh, I believe, uh, the 70s, uh, 1980, they added another 59, added another 11 back in 2007. So this would be another round of 12 additional judgeships where uh, Calumet County probably is, is as acute of a need as you can imagine. Uh, there are um, 11 lesser populated counties that have two judgeships. Calumet currently has one. There are three lesser populated counties that have three circuit court branches. So even with adding an additional judge to Calumet County, um, Calumet is going to be uh, on the, the harder end of uh, you know, what it's battling in terms of caseload. And that has a real impact on the justice system in terms of being able to participate in treatment courts, in terms of being able to move cases along so that there's healing for victims, there's treatment for um, defendants, and um, you know, it, it's just, uh, there are, there are certainly things that I have a district that goes all the way up to the tip of uh, Door County. In particular, Washington Island had some issues where their cable, their lifeline, was cut as a result of ice flows. And um, they would otherwise have probably been eligible for disaster assistance. But because they're so isolated, um, there, there's kind of a, a technicality. And so there's funding that was proposed by Governor Evers, which I appreciate in the budget for uh, for assisting them with repairing that cable. Um, you know, that there are certainly, um, you know, needs across my district that I'll look at. I and mean, typically, the, in the Senate, because you have smaller margins of, of majority, uh, you get to ask a little bit more. But although, in the Assembly, I always uh, would joke, or at least tell everybody, that I was on joint finance, you're all my budget buddies. I'm, I'm very, uh, very aggressive. I'm, uh, approaching, you know, and, and I talked with, uh, sat down with Governor Evers and told him my priorities, sat down with uh, the co-chairs of the Finance Committee, sat down with my leadership, and uh, so I, I know the run, you know, certainly is going to be a very aggressive advocate for the area as well, and, uh, you know, we have other um, other things that have been put off that I know that, that Ron has been a supporter of as well in terms of the, uh, the criminal justice system or just our, our court system. And, uh, you know, Ron has been an uh, advocate when we've had standalone legislation to add the level of, add to the number of assistant DAs, uh, increase the public defender reimbursement rate, uh, help with the, the counties with the increased reimbursement rate they're seeing as a result of the court decision, and the crime rate in terms of being able to 
uh, make sure that evidence is processed so that you can have uh, you know a, a swifter swifter justice and again uh, accomplish all of those things that I said in terms of treatment courts and um, additional um, you know, victims' rights protections and uh, being able to, to help rehabilitate uh, those that are guilty. All right. Well, better keep going. We don't want to. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, I mean that. <laughs> <laughs> I know people have individual issues they might want to talk to too, so I don't want anybody to um, spend more of their Saturday than they're than they're planning. Um, all right. So again, I'll let you take a look at this real quick. You're gonna notice gas tax is in there. Oh, sure, I can. Yeah, no, I can read them all. Yeah, so um, one of the points I was gonna make is notice gas tax isn't in there. That's because kind of what I was talking about with the transportation fund being separate, because transportation fund is separate. Gas tax would certainly have a pretty big chunk of that if all of our funds went to one source. But because this is just regarding general fund, that's why you won't see gas tax in there, uh, or your registration fees, or other things that you are actually paying to the state, because that goes directly to that transportation. But anyway, so uh, it's what you'll see there is it's regarding the different tax percentages of where the state generates that seventy-six billion dollars that is, that was last year the amount of money that we generated. So how much? Of, what is our income? And it's fifty-two percent income tax. So fifty-two percent of what we receive is the income tax that you pay. Thirty-four percent is sales tax. Seven percent is corporate tax. Public utilities generate 2%, and then excise taxes is 4%. And then this little sliver here, I guess, is insurance. So that's basically what that is showing is where does this money come in? Does anybody have any questions about that? We can just move on to the next one. All right, I'll go All right. Taxes over the years. All right, so what this is talking about is tax and fee increases or decreases by budget. So on the left side, what you're seeing is, is what are the, so I'm gonna ask Andrew a question on this. Is that 2009-2011 number for Doyle, mm -hmm. is that what was actually passed? Yeah, I'm sure that was probably the that's net. That, that, was, that, that was, was what you just proposed, okay. No, no, that would, that would have been, yeah. okay. So that's the increases, tax increases or decreases uh, on a yearly basis. So we have a biennium budget, that just means every two years. Um, so every two years, these are kind of what you see. So in 2009-2011, obviously a, a pretty massive uh, tax increase that looks like it's probably roughly around 15% if Governor Evers is at 10%. Um, this is a small decrease, 13-15 was a pretty large decrease, um, a small decrease. I think that's a decrease. I can't really tell which side of the line, the imaginary line it's on. Um, and then it looks like a small decrease again in 1719. So that's kind of how, so you can tell generally, you know, between 2009 and 2021, uh, if we did, if we end up doing Governor Evers' budget identical to what he's proposed, which I've already told you, I don't think that's really how the process works. But um, you can see that we still are increasing taxes more than decreasing taxes since 2009, despite the fact that uh, uh, we're decreasing much slower than other states. And that's been a huge business generator for us, uh, probably our biggest business generator, uh, compared to where we were. When we, after the 2009-2011, when Governor Walker became our governor, we were the 41st worst tax state. So we were, we were taxing more, or per person, more than 41 other states. We've gotten better. We haven't really gotten as, you know, we've got, you know where we're at currently? No, I don't know if that's my head either, but um, basically we've gotten significantly better, but we're still not in like the top 10 or anything like that. It's basically we've improved by the lack of increases, not really the lack of decreases, so, but. Does anybody have any questions on that? Oh, we do. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, to say that there's a tax increase and then just leave it at that mm -hmm. is kind of disingenuous because the questions that follow from that are who is paying that tax increase, who should be paying that tax increase. If corporations are only paying 7%, 
contributing 7% into the, the revenue pot. Sure. And tax individuals like ourselves in this room are contributing 52%. There's a lot of wiggle room there to change the relationships. And those corporations, they all use our roads, they use our courts, they use all those things that, that are funded by the state dollars. So I would think, to be a little bit more honest, you need to break down what the plans are, like the, the middle class tax cut is proposed in this budget. Yeah. Um, so that just well, to make sure that, I mean, that paints a picture that's not totally clear. Sure, well with that 7%, so I guess that's the last slide, but uh, uh, with that 7%, remember that's double taxation. So those people are also getting taxed the income tax. So that same individual that was taxed once at income that fed that 52% also is feeding that additional corporate tax. But the trick with corporate taxes in Wisconsin is we have pretty high corporate income tax compared to other states. And that's a real difficult thing when attracting new businesses or keeping businesses like Manitowoc Crane in Wisconsin. We lost Manitowoc Crane because we had that tax increase. If we would have had a, if we would have had a lower corporate income tax, they would because they didn't move to China or Mexico. They moved to Pennsylvania, where they had better numbers. Now I'd rather keep them there, keep them here, and get some money, and, and also get the income tax from those people that have jobs, than to see them move off to Pennsylvania or a different state that have lower that has lower corporate tax. So I don't really see our corporate taxes as very fungible at all. I don't think you can generate much more out of that. If anything, you know, if we decreased, it would see more jobs. And now that's right now we're doing really great with jobs, so maybe that's not the number one priority. But um, that's kind of the give and take that you see. So. Well, and, and, and one thing that I would add is that if you're taxing something, you're, you're disincentivizing. In many cases, disincentivizing, like Ron is saying, business location. But there are also things like you could say, well. Governor Evers proposes a truck tax, a heavy truck tax. Well, yes, it might be taxing certain industries and might have an impact on what those industries choose to do in Wisconsin, but certainly a lot of taxes on businesses get passed on to consumers. And certainly, I think most households purchase things that are trucked some distance, and that probably gets passed along, you know, as well. So. Yeah, yeah, that's the other trick. That's another good point is is that, you know, with those corporate taxes, it just increased the amount of costs. And one of the great things about being in Wisconsin is is that our cost of living is so low that our dollars mean a lot more than they do just on the other side of the border in Chicago. So that's a huge advantage for us. It also attracts people to come to Wisconsin. That's why if you look at kind of how I think they've lost maybe 50, is it like 50, 40,000, 50,000 people a year are leaving Illinois and moving to surrounding states. Wisconsin being, I think, the second most popular. Indiana is still more popular, but there are tons of people moving from that kind of big tax state to Wisconsin for a reason, and it's because their their money is more valuable here. It's for other reasons, but including uh, their money is more valuable here, and then they're not going to be taxed as much. Can I bring up something? Yeah, go ahead. When you talked about uh, about the truck uh, on the registration, uh, uh, that that I. I kind of think that that, uh, that if a company buying a new truck, they're just gonna they're just gonna register it in a different state anyway. If you drive down the uh, down the road, watch, watch the license on the trucks. Boy, they're from all all different states. Schneider's all that stuff can be strategic. Schneider has been doing that back in the 70s, well, yeah. registering yeah. everything in Illinois, or, <laughs> and a lot of your bigger trucking companies all do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think Maryland a few years back passed a, a millionaire's tax, and then millionaires just moved to one of the, the surrounding states. But certainly, we have any number of, of border issues on, on policy issues as well. Everything from you know purchasing uh, cigarettes now, or there's a lottery issue when Illinois had to suspend their their lottery because they had to give out IOUs, or you know there was a, a, a regulatory issue I was able to handle for a food processor where. Uh, and, and luckily, even DACAP realized that, that it was uh, not a consumer product issue. But you had Michigan that was offering offering them free land and all these other incentives if they go just on the other side of the border. I mean, what we have to understand is we are in competition with other states, and, and yes, we are successfully competing with Illinois for workforce, which is very important right now. All right. Um, but this is a, a little bit of something that's 
I mean, not necessarily a question for you guys because our jurisdiction ends at the state line. Right. Um, but sort of, sort of raises the question of how do you keep large uh, corporations from playing one state against another because that's sort of what's happening then is, is what you're we talked about is that. what we're alluding to here is well okay then it becomes a race to the bottom one state tries to underbid the other and then every municipality loses revenue because we're all just trying to be a little better well we talked about that a lot actually when I was in law school we were talking about kind of jurisdiction and that kind of I remember some really interesting debates regarding how we should maybe do things differently. But I'm actually uh, the state's representative in the Uniform Law Commission. With the Uniform Law Commission, it's a group that's 150 years old. And Woodrow Wilson was there. Uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist was in it. Some of the greatest uh, names in American history were part of this Uniform Law Commission. And they had the same concern that you have. Because that issue is something that we had during the railroad years. We had, like, that is an issue that is, is not completely, <laughs> yeah, has completely gone our entire history. And as Wisconsin's representative in the ULC, the Uniform Law Commission, we actually look into laws and we talk about that very issue of how do we uniformly pass something uh, that will basically decentivize people from playing that game. And that's a big conversation that we have. That board has, you know, Justice uh, David Prosser, who's from Appleton, a former Supreme Court justice. Uh, it has uh, Democrats, uh, Gary Eagles now on that board, uh, who's a Democrat from Madison. Uh, he's planning on going up to Alaska this year, too. Fred Risser has been on there before. Oh, yeah, Fred Risser's all, yeah, he's been there forever. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, those are just kind of names that best capital people know, but he's a senator from Madison. So. Longest serving state legislator in the country. You ever want to see a cool story? The Fred Rister story is really interesting. He, his dad was in the legislature from like 1919 or 18 or something like that until like the 1960s, and then his son just took over his seat, and his son's been in the seat since like the 1960s, so continuously. So they've had the same two guys representing them for closing in 100 years. And I've done a couple bills, uh, actually one with Fred Rister on the uniform enforcement of domestic violence protective orders. Uh, across states, uh, just so you have that again, that level playing field. That's something that got passed right now. There's a bill I'm doing with uh, Representative Rob Brooks on uh, athlete agents, so that you don't have uh, you know people gaming the system that way in terms of trying to um, take advantage of amateur athletes. Um, but yeah, it, it's. Uh, You know, the thing is, though, that in the state legislature, for the most part, we love those ULC bills. And the reason why we love them is because we see that problem, too. And we don't really want to try to figure out how we can game in Kansas or something either. I, I mean, it would be much nicer to just basically say, all right, well, this is a resolved issue. Let's move on to some other stuff. Because when you do that, it also takes legislative time and legislative resources to try to do those games, too. So, no, I, no it's definitely just a, just a thought uh, is I've been around companies who have moved uh, a lot before, and the tax rate is one factor, right? And so that's the key here. I mean, th th this issue is going to always be an issue, right? And nobody's interested, I don't think, in you know racing Mississippi to the bottom or something like that, you know, or you know trying to buy for every single last dollar. And that's why you have to compete on on things like uh, uh, education of the workforce yeah. and infrastructure yes. and all these sorts of things. These become the things that, and frankly, it sounds you know silly to say. I, like I said, I've been around a lot of companies that have moved. A lot of times companies move and locate in places this is where the CEO wants to live, right? And it can be some really basic things that it, it's down to, right? Um, oh, it can be, yeah, it can be a lot of things. It is, it, it, it does, so it's very much part of the company, right? right? Yeah, I mean, uh, like that, uh, I've, seen, uh, I've seen whole corporations move as a CEO wants to live in Dallas just to somewhere else, you know? And, uh, well, one of the things we're so, doing so, with... So, so yeah, I'm just saying you have to... You have to compete on a lot of. Oh, certainly there there are there are a number of factors. Uh, even everything from the weather or where infrastructure is located in terms of roads and. Right. and uh, I'm all city roads. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, but but uh, uh, one thing I was going to add. One of the bills that I did a few sessions ago dealt with uh, multi-jurisdictional TIF districts because you do otherwise have that issue not just among states but between communities. You have uh, like a Cabela's or. Uh, Bass Pro Shops or, or some of these larger retailers where there was you know, a, a definite desire to bring them in and, and add to the tax base. 
but then they'd be getting incredible deals because they would just go to several different uh, jurisdictions and say, well, well, what can you offer me? Well, they offered me this. Can you beat that? Can you beat that? Can you, and then going back and forth. And uh, what multi-jurisdictional TIF districts allow you to do is to say, hey, within a, a certain tract of area, we're all going to kind of share that, that increment. We're all going to have a, a, an incentive for joint marketing. And um, I think the more that we can do that in terms of eliminating some of that the, the unhealthy competition, um, you know, there's still going to be uh, some opportunities for that. Well, one of the things we're really excelling in Wisconsin uh, regarding educating our workforce is our STEM labs. Wisconsin has more STEM labs in the state of Wisconsin than the rest of the country combined. We're really doing a great job trying to, and if you go to like Kimberly High School, has got a ton of really cool things that they're doing. Brilliant really leads the way in, some, in that too. Uh, they've got a real close connection with Aaron's and some of the manufacturing uh, within Brilliant. Um, but basically, those school districts uh, and their STEM labs have really helped kind of bridge that gap. And I think, again, other states are going to look to Wisconsin when they see us keeping our manufacturing and attracting more because our workforce has the right skills. And that's kind of one of the tricks is, is you know, we, we only have so much we can do to encourage Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin students to, you know, get the right skills that they need to be the most attractive as possible to future employers. Um, but that's one of the big things that we've done that I, I suspect other states are really going to pick up on once they see that it's working. Because it, it's, there's no way it's not working. It's, it, there's kids that are excited about going into these fields that just, you know, they don't, those fields don't generally attract the excitement and attention. You know, welding doesn't necessarily <coughs> excite the attention and attraction as, you know, maybe website design or something like that. But, you know, so welding is what we need. Among other things. Lots of jobs or something I'm sorry, we came in late, so I apologize. Oh, no. But are we going to have an opportunity to maybe share with you some of the things that we think should be in the budget or to endorse certain things? And, and is that going to come after the presentation? Yeah, probably. I mean, I'm pretty flexible with all of this. Okay. I just want to be respectful of everybody else that's spending their time here today, too. Right, right. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, we'll just kind of bounce around, and I'm here as long as I, as long as somebody has something they want to talk about. So okay. I have the next one of these at noon. So all right, if it takes till noon, I'm happy. So. Yeah. Okay. Under that, you know, format. I didn't know if you had a presentation that you wanted to finish before we. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to bounce this over to healthcare. Okay. Sure. <laughs> um, so uh, quite a different topic here, but um, I am a general dentist. I've been practicing in, in this area for 36 years. Um, when I first came to Wisconsin, I took Medicaid because okay. it actually paid like between 50 and 75 five percentile of what it cost us to provide the care, which at least we were breaking even. Yep. Um, and after about five or six years, the number never got increased, so um, a lot of my colleagues, and most of them actually, have dropped being Medicaid providers. Yeah. Um, so we are now the 48th state in our country, 48th lowest paid state as dental providers for Medicaid. I mean, we're near the bottom. So that's why no one is providing this care, because they can't afford to. So we're paid at 27 cents on the dollar. I don't think any business can be you know, asked to provide something for 27 cents on the dollar. So um, the governor has put in his budget um, a dental therapist uh, notion. So this would be a whole new dental provider. So we have dentists and assistants and hygienists that provide care in Wisconsin. Yeah. And contrary to sort of the rumor uh, is that dentists don't have a shortage of, of providers. So physicians may have shortages, nurses may have shortages, but dentists don't have shortages in the state of Wisconsin. We're actually pretty well covered over the entire state. So uh, there was a pilot put in place by Governor Walker uh, about 18 months ago um, in force four counties in Wisconsin. Includes Brown County. Very and Brown years. County was one of them, yes. And he increased uh, the dental reimbursement for Medicaid in those counties to see if that would actually, you know, do anything. And lo and behold, it was only, you know, it's only been like 18 months, maybe a little less than that. But lo and behold, it increased the provider sign up by 33%. So 33% more dentists signed up to be Medicaid providers. Yeah. And 35% of those providers saw 100 patients or more. So that's a huge impact. So I think, you know, and now Governor um, Evers is uh, proposing to stop that, that, um, that pilot program. 
Um, but it's actually only been in existence for 18 months, and it's already showing that it's got traction, that it's actually working. So I guess what I'm here to say is, is that a dental therapist, and there's only one state in the entire country that does dental therapy, that's in Minnesota. They have a program for 10 years. Um, it takes three years to graduate as a dental therapist. It's very expensive. Marquette University will not, they don't have room in their building to, to educate these therapists. So basically, they've only graduated 90. Minnesota's only graduated 90 providers in 10 years. And guess where they all live? Minnesota. In Minneapolis. <laughs> so the idea was is to get the rural area sure. areas covered, but guess where the dental therapists want to live? Right. So their their 10 year very expensive program, and now their now their dentists are asking because they're paid at very low rates as well. They're asking for higher Medicaid rates now, and they're already paying for a dental dental therapist program. So what I'm here to say is that you know the dental therapist program is not the way to go. It's very expensive. It's going to take us three years to graduate anybody, and it's going to take us a very long time for these people in place. And guess where they're going to want to live? Appleton, Milwaukee. <laughs> you know, so it's not addressing our rural problems. Okay. Yeah. So I think our pilot is showing some promise. I think that we need to ask that that be continued and not expanded. And, and we already have a workforce ready to go. Just pay us and we'll do the work. Well, and I've, I've been supportive of, uh, of the expansion. I was supportive of uh, the pilot. Uh, so, uh, I mean, actually, that's one of the things that we do have across the board very low Medicaid reimbursement rates. I mean, that's one of the, the issues that I have in general with. The, the federal government, you know, we sign on the dotted line to administer a program, and then we have to put a lot of state dollars in to try to prop it up, and we're kind of left holding the bag for, you know, the federal government budget is not balance, so they just gradually start to reduce what their responsibility is, and, right. and we have to, to kind of pick up the balance. And uh, we didn't get, like with Obamacare, the, the Cornhusker kickback the Louisiana purchase, I mean, there are political calculations in terms of how Medicaid rates have been set in other states. And uh, so it, it's something that, uh, no, I, I think the, the low reimbursement rates certainly have a, a significant uh, you know, barrier to access as well as, um, yeah. yeah. So well, let's have, yeah. So first off, I thought you really put that really eloquently. I really like, you know, you're definitely a good advocate for uh, this particular issue. What I'd like William to do is tape down your name and William's got me. He's got your yeah. name. I met with William. Yep. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. Oh, at the office. Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks for doing that too. I yeah. appreciate that. I know that that's you know um, that's a, a two-hour drive. So um, I'll have a folder of information for you that really out, you know just kind of outlines all of this. Well, let's let's so William, if you can look into the budget, see what our side is kind of proposing on that. If not, I'd like to do a budget motion in favor of continuing on Governor Walker's. Program. If it's successful, especially if it's helping our rural areas, yeah. um, I'm really in favor of that. I've had, got a couple other programs regarding uh, kind of pilot programs regarding trying to attract dentists and trying to attract uh, public defenders to our rural areas where we need them the most. Um, and this is definitely something that I'd like to, like to make sure yeah. we do everything we can to make that happen. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you. That makes a lot more sense to me than the therapist stuff that exactly. I did too. So. Great. Thanks very much for listening. Hey, you bet. Okay. Yeah. Um, anybody else have any questions before we move on? Yes, please. I just wanted to piggyback on the Medicaid conversation. Sure. My name is Terry. I'm the administrator of Matita Assisted Living. Okay. Um, and we support a lot of people that are funded by Medicaid. Yep. Um, Medicaid pays us at about a 55% rate of what we would get prior. Okay. One thing that made a huge impact last year. Yep was the director of workforce funding. Okay. And what that was is you gave us a chunk of cash, each company depending on the number of people that were Medicaid funded, the number of days we supported them. Okay. Um, which allowed us to go directly to our workforce. So what that allowed us to do here, and the impact has been significant. Um, I was able to raise wages by a dollar an hour which allowed me to keep really good team members, but also recruit really good team members. Um, the consistency is meant for our programs because I can hire the best staff in the world if they can, you know, pay for the gas to get there. Yeah. You know, that's a challenge, but when 
the workforce is stable, the residents are better. It's just overall such a higher quality of care um, that it's just been impactful. And I know it's in the budget that's been proposed, and I'm asking that it's kept. And these are thank you cards. Oh, look at that. I was wondering what that was. Thank you. Well, let's take a quick picture. Yeah. 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 to try to talk about what to do regarding redistricting and what, how we should or shouldn't change kind of the current format, the current way we do that. Um, that's an issue that I'm not going to tackle until after we're done with the budget. Uh, the budget's an immediate issue. The districting issue, we can't even touch until the census starts. 
and the, or the census is completed and they have the actual numbers of, of how our state will change and how it should change and all those types of things. But, I mean, you're talking about, you know, hundreds of different issues that go along with the redistricting um, and uh, um, it's not a subject and it sounds like you're pretty familiar with the subject. It's, you know, I think you probably agree this is a, a full day conversation type of subject. It isn't, uh, isn't something that we can talk about. <coughs> sure, Ron, I can, I can try to address just, it really just quick. Just a second, Senator, just want to add what um, my wife said. We, we, we came down here to, to talk about this issue as it relates to the budget. Maybe there are complicated issues and where the lines are drawn and so on, but at this point, the question is, should $10,000 stay in the $78 billion or whatever it is budget to start the process of nonpartisan boundary drawing? Sure. Now, the legislature has been willing to spend $3.5 million to create districts in secret and then defend them in court. All we're saying is, let's put 10000 in the budget so that we can start a nonpartisan process. You take that out of the process, out of the budget, then it becomes a standalone le a legislative issue. Yeah. And I don't see the Republican legislature being real interested in introducing legislation to affect their districts. It's the time to do it is right now in the budget, ten thousand dollars. Here's the thing, though: you're not really talking about ten thousand dollars. No, you're talking about, about twenty thousand because it's ten thousand each year. Well, and. But what you're talking about is should we move toward a nonpartisan uh, pick? And this is something, so we've redrawn maps in America over 500 or 1,000 times. And what we've found is in Wisconsin, we've tried every single option. We've tried nonpartisan drawing. We've tried the courts drawing. We've tried every single, there's a, we've redrawn our maps, I think 13 times, because uh, two 10-year periods, we weren't able to come up with any sort of resolution. It's something that's always in the past been very dramatic and very difficult, but what we've found is every time that we've tried a nonpartisan group, and other states have found nonpartisan groups, that they're basically, the nonpartisan groups still end up being Republicans versus Democrats, and basically there still is that intermingling. Now if you can find a company, if you can find 20 angels that can draft us, you know, draft, you know, draft the, you know, or do our maps in a truly, you know, fair way, that would be great. But I think the Iowa model is, is quite a good example. They've had no lawsuits from either side. And I think if we looked at that model, well, like I said, no, it's, 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 it's such a complex no, issue. That was not a good answer. Well, well for, first thing I'd like to say, though, and I think Ron actually made this point in a press release, but this is actually, we have a nonpartisan legislative fiscal bureau, just like this is nonpartisan redistricting, but the, the fiscal bureau at the start of every budget process goes through the budget and determines a number of provisions that are considered non-fiscal policy items where the policy considerations are much more significant than the, the amount of, of funding expended. In this case, uh, it's kind of the attempt to maybe run non-budgetary bills largely through, I mean, the $10,000 would not hit the, uh, the threshold for any other uh, bill having to go through finance in terms of the standalone bills that we pass. So, more than likely, this, this is something that the Fiscal Bureau is going to recommend in its document of non-fiscal policy items that are always kind of removed by the, the chairs of the Finance Committee at the start of every budget process. So it is likely to be something that is going to be a, a separate discussion. I, I will say um, I've always been open to it, you know anything that makes sense in terms of improving any state laws or any processes or the redistricting process. I actually was drawn out of my district the last round of redistricting. I, but that being said, I, I do think there are important considerations. And I think uh, one is, is that you now, if you look at what the governor has proposed, um, you have a, a percentage of deviation which could have a one state senate district having 165 constituents and another having 180,000 constituents. That's a bit of, of, of a high deviation for me. Uh, as Ron said, a majority of the, the appointments. Uh, made for this redistricting commission are made by partisan elected officials. You would really have just one person who, who would be there on a nonpartisan basis. And so it, it really would be very heavily dependent on the, the determination of that, that one individual. But the other thing is that, yes, you might have maps drawn uh, and, and, and put forward to the legislature. There's no requirement that the legislature actually has to pass them. And in fact, there are provisions about, well, just 
sending it back or sending it back with some tweaks. But the reality is that if, if the legislature doesn't like a map, they won't pass it, and it's just going to end up in the court process, which is typically what we have in redistricting anyways. So, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to just say, you know, nonpartisan redistricting sounds great, and there are a lot of things that sound great, but the details are still concerning. And, and when you talk a little bit about, like, the percentage of um, people that voted for a Democrat versus a Republican, well, there's issues with that, too, because, for instance, one of the years that was cited, I didn't have a, uh, a Democratic opponent. I didn't have yeah, and why? What's that? Why? I don't know. I had to defeat I a Democrat for my seat. You were going to get 90% of the votes anyway. No, <laughs> no, I wasn't. Right. I wasn't, sir. All right, well, let's... And there are plenty of Democrats around. Right. Uh, we're hardly talking about it. <laughs> All right, you're right. Like I said, this is going to be full. <laughs> let's talk about it. But that being said, I do want to have session. I do want to talk about this issue. It's just the other folks here that didn't drive as far as you guys are, are here for other issues too, not just your issue. So. But and I do want to be respectful of that issue, uh, worthwhile concern. But um, uh, I do have to leave fairly soon, so I apologize. But um, I wanted to speak a little bit about education. And you mentioned that K twelve is a large portion of the state budget. Fifty one percent. Um, and, uh, and Ron, I didn't realize you were a teacher. I was. I taught, yeah. uh, well, I was. I have an urban education degree for a from UW Milwaukee. And uh, then I taught in three different schools in Milwaukee Public Schools uh, Westside One, Bell Accelerated Middle School before, in the last semester before, Bray Elementary, No Child Left Behind, and then uh, uh, Baby Light School, where I taught uh, U.S. History Civil War President. So I loved it. Loved cool. Love teaching. It was awesome. Um, so I'm a teacher also. Um, what do you I, teach? I teach uh, middle middle school music. Yes, that's right. That's, that's, that's the look I'm used that's to getting. Be tough. <laughs> that's gonna be tough. I didn't I didn't fare well in middle school. I yeah. didn't have a disciplinary. So yeah. Yeah. So Not a lot of us have fond memories of middle school. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you gotta be. So we try to make some. Oh, yeah. We try to make some. Um, so um, I live in your district, but I teach in. Um, Paul Tittle's district. Uh, I don't oh, have children. Okay. Um, so um, I feel like um, over the past five to ten years, we have sort of we have a potential for a looming teacher shortage. I believe in our state, and we're starting to see that now. Um, I feel we have. When I started teaching 20 years ago, if there was a, and maybe when you started as well, Ron, if there was a job posting. You get 100 applicants, and you have the cream of the crop. Um, and um, rough, I'm thinking of one position in particular in our district that um, seven years ago had an opening. We interviewed six candidates. Any of them would have done well. Um, that same position was open last year. We had a hard time finding six people to interview. And, um, and thank God we got the one that we got, because the 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 pool is much thinner, and um, and I don't see people going. I don't see young people going into the teacher preparation programs at nearly the same rate. Um, when I started, there was um, a glut of folks who were substitute teaching again experience. Um, within the past two weeks, within my building, there's been four days where there have been unfilled um, teacher absences. So then other teachers are covering during their prep time, not using the time to plan for their next classes, or they're absorbing somebody else's class, come on in. This sort of situation isn't best for the kids. Um, they're not getting the best educational experience out of this situation. Yeah. Um, and Perhaps 10 years ago, there was a need for correction in, um, you know, maybe labor relations or maybe, um, you know, pay increases or reining in tax rates. Um, now I feel like there might be evidence for overcorrection, or we need to start reinvesting it. Yeah, I don't because know. I feel like. Um, you mentioned um, STEM programs, um, and those are 
crucially important to developing our workforce. Um, our district could not find a tech ed teacher the last time we had an opening. We, we have a wonderful individual that is filling that position, is yeah. not a licensed teacher, is not a trained individual, but, and he's, I mean, he's going through his coursework now and trying to get that, but it's, it's becoming a problem, and it, these sorts of problems unfold in slow motion, and I feel like, I, I want to let you know about it. Yeah. So, no, because. And I'm kind of interested in what you'll say to this question. So, yeah. like, I think about what I was thinking about when you were probably thinking about when we were in school and deciding to be teachers. Right. I don't know what's changed. Like, what, what has changed from when I was thinking about being a teacher? Because I guess, what was I thinking about? I thought it sounded like a pretty good gig, and I thought it sounded like summer's off in Wisconsin made some sense. You know, I mean, it was so much, you know, I, and I love history. I just have a real passion for it. I really love it. You know, I listen to books on tape all the time about different historical issues and stuff. But I don't know. I don't really get, like, what, it, is it the public perception of, of being a teacher that's changed? I can do like something. I saw that up close yeah. I, after awesome. I retired in 2010. I did a few years of sub-teaching in Wapaka and in the Madison area, and the devastation, devastation was almost immediate. For one thing, the pool of subs <laughs> dried up because you didn't have that right, yeah. steady stream uh, from the university anymore because the people don't see the value in it. I got worked to death. I finally couldn't work in the sub. Yeah, we're actually uh, working on And the then, place, not right? only that, but teachers' pay now was limited to, what, cost of living? So teachers are jumping districts to get a raise in DeForest. In one year, we lost three math teachers. Yeah. You know, because that's the only way they could make more and, money. Yeah. And Ron, I feel like the um, just like this um, this woman was talking about rural areas being disappropriately impacted. Um, in a rural district, you start to feel like you are a training ground for. A larger district or a more suburban district, because we can't afford to um, to keep up with the salaries and such offered. Now I've been teaching in our district for 20 years, and I feel very connected to the people there, and that's why I choose to stay there because I'm committed to them. Um, but if you do have a promising young teacher who you know maybe doesn't didn't originally come from the area or or doesn't have family connections or family ties and it's very easy after a few years, well, we can go somewhere with that has more resources. Yeah, we'd have to pay them more to keep them there because right. their, their contacts are, and their right. connections are stronger right. in a different place. Right. And, and in our own district in particular, and this is not necessarily a statewide issue, but I believe um, the last there was recently opportunity for more aid to small districts, but then there was the stipulation that if you had had a failed referendum within the last two to three years, I can't remember the details, but whatever the detail was that caught our district, we were not able to benefit from the extra aid because we had a narrowly defeated referendum within the last couple of years, and so then it was kind of double whammy. <laughs> that, was, that was just delayed, though. I think ultimately your district is still going to be able to, to catch up on that. I, sure. I think however, that, however, though, Andre, um, however, we're also limited to increasing our salary schedule by the annual CPI increase, or or whatever the board is able to to pay. Sure. So, getting us behind this one year, we won't be allowed to increase double CPI or something. No, well, I mean, I, I, there, there's certainly, I mean, so, it, so it does hold us consistently behind. Well, and, and there is the, the referendum thing, but the, there was actually additional uh, additional tier of sparsity aid that was proposed. I know that we're looking at that again in terms of helping the rural districts. I've heard a, a few other possibilities that I'm, I'm supportive of, but yes, we, we have inequities in our, our school aid formula, maybe not as, as severe as within the um, Shared revenue formula, but um, you know, and, and that's one of the things that, that we had the uh, Blue Ribbon Task Force take a look at. But specific to what you were talking about in terms of the shortage, and 
And I'll tell you, you know, dealing with workforce development, that's one of the areas of my committee. Um, you know, you were just talking about it within, you know, health care and long-term care, and we have it with daycare, we have it with, but honestly, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. We have more people leaving the workforce in retirement, you know, the baby boomers, than are entering the workforce. And part of that is, is birth rate and, and just different things where, you know, again, luckily we are bringing people in from, uh, you know, from Illinois. We are having, you know, positive, you know, net migration in terms of, you know, otherwise we'd be, we'd be in some trouble. But uh, one of the things that the Greater Green Bay Chamber came to me with was we have a youth apprenticeship program and they have a very robust one in Green Bay, um, but we only have 11 of the 16 career clusters. And among the five career clusters that we don't currently have any tracks for are teaching and training, law enforcement, law, uh, public safety, uh, human services, which would include social workers, um, public, uh, public administration, and business management. And um, that's something that I have legislation, I think you're on that bill, Ron, but to, to, to expand all 16 career clusters, DWD is saying, well, we don't have a demand in those five areas. Well, I think, re, re, you know, if you talk to police chiefs, they're going to say they have the same problem in terms of the number of qualified applicants or the people in the pipeline. There's, there's some other things we're looking at there. But, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with you know, the fact that we have an aging population and we're going to have even more acute needs in terms of caring for them. But now, William, maybe you know this. In the budget, is Governor Evers asking to increase? It sounds like, you know, kind of your perception is, is that that cost of living increase being limited to your, your pay increase is being limited to your cost of, cost of living increase. Is there a proposal in the current budget saying we should get rid of that and we should increase? Because I don't think I've heard that yet. I am not aware of anything. You can look into it, though. Yeah, I'd be curious to see. Um, you know, Governor Amber surprised himself in, in being up to date with this stuff and really fighting for for our schools. Um, and I would think that would be something. So I'd be interested if it's not what his angle is, because I'm sure there's there's thought to that perspective. <laughs> there's some reason he doesn't think it's appropriate. Um, but I mean, I. To me, I think school superintendents should be able to pay the teachers what they want to pay and what they want to pay them. Well, and at least that's to the be... Because if they have the money and they think that's the best way to use the money, right. who am I at the state level to go into Hilbert and say, Hilbert, you're, you don't know, you know your finances as well as I do, <coughs> uh, so you can't afford it even though you think you can. Right, right. well, and just to, to be competitive um, with other larger places, or just to be competitive as a profession in yeah. general. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I, I just I think that we need to, the current perception regarding that not being a lucrative or that being a good deal, I don't know. I just, I didn't have that perception when I was there. And, and you know, if I would have continued on with that career, uh, instead of going on to law school, I think I'd probably feel the same way you do. And that's, you know, this is not really probably what I felt like I signed up for. You know, so. But anyway, yeah, thanks for bringing that concern. Thank you. Oh, the young lady that was talking about the Medicaid uh, yeah. payment, other reimbursements. Mm -hmm. um, 36 states have taken the federal dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, boy, 36 states have taken those dollars. There must be some good in there. You know, why, why doesn't Wisconsin jump in the board on, the, on board with that? Because I know a lot of people say it's going to cost yeah. other people money. I don't know if... Uh, yeah, so it's all kind of about the finances and how does that work. And so Wisconsin, again, like I said before, one of the things we're not real good at is patting ourselves on our own back. We have the highest standard of health care in the United States. Um, and uh, that's a, a pretty cool thing to say that we have. Um, How do you make it? How do you get that? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, was that one of our... Uh, well, I think the new, the, the, I think the governor here has been VHS secretary, more or less, uh, made those same points at the confirmation hearing in terms of yeah, what sure. we do on, in terms of overall quality access and, and, and the fact that we, you know, we go up to 100% yeah. of federal poverty level. Yeah. Which, that's is, which is something that a lot of states would love to do. Yeah. That's, that's true. Yeah. And yeah. William can probably find that. So right. We had that on our Facebook. That was one of the things that, that came from the state of Wisconsin. For, we all have access to that health care, though? Can we all go to Mayo well, Clinic or? 
Uh, let me answer Dewey's, or Dewey's, uh, Dewey's questions before I answer that. So uh, what he was concerned about is why don't we take that Medicare money. The reason why we don't take that Medicare money is that while it will uh, increase our state coffers, so what we're talking about is this is money from the federal government that we would be receiving. We'd receive $200 million from the federal government if we follow certain requirements that they have. Those requirements will cost our healthcare professionals $600 million. So if we do, if we take that $200 million for our own coffers and cost our hospital $600 million to basically uh, um, uh, meet those requirements, um, and more, it, it's not so much in requirements as it is uh, uh, finances that we basically, they'll just get paid less from the federal government on Medicare. Um, Medicaid. Medicare. Medicare. Is it Medicaid? Okay. Um, I get those two mixed up a bit, but um, they'll get that less money and then basically it costs our state more because it's just going to get flipped over to all the other consumers um, that, are not, that, aren't, that aren't on Medicare or Medicaid. It won't cost the hospitals anymore. They reimburse less. it 90% instead of 60%. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's well, no, different not percentages. Really. The other states okay. aren't, aren't also, complaining. It's what they're saying now versus <laughs> what is actually going to end up. I mean, the, the federal government can change the rules at any time. The only way that we can get the federal government to change the rules is with their permission through the waiver process. And again, we have right now a very low Medicaid uh, reimbursement rate. I, I think the, the concern is that, you know, Minnesota took the, the expansion and then they had to pump hundreds of millions of, of their state dollars into it. There's maintenance of efforts requirements. Wisconsin did an expansion without taking the money. And part of that is so that we're not on the hook down the road for some of those increased costs. I mean, I think one of the concerns, and then Ron and I think saw this last session, there were democratic proposals in a lot of different ways on the floor to take the Medicaid expansion and then spend that money. And where were they spending that money? Not on, on actual health care, but they were going to just basically treat it as fungible money, free money. We'll take that money, we'll spend it on roads. We'll take that money, we'll spend it on, on K-12. We'll take that money and put it in the UW system. I mean, and, and I think that's, that's one of the concerns is that, you know, I'm a grant writer in terms of, I used to be the Brown County grant writer. I did that for the city of Green Bay as well. Um, there are strings that are attached, and you know it, it's not. It, you know there, there used to be that guy with the question marks all over his suit on TV and talking about there's all this free money through all these different government programs, and just buy his book and he'd tell you how to get all this free money from the government to do all these these crazy wonderful things. And the reality is there there, there is no free money like that, and it. It's I take something. free money. I, if it was free money, I would take it. You're if still I, paying I to cover it from those the federal people. government and have your federal taxes that you sent to, to D.C. back to Wisconsin. It was a net positive. I would do it. it. The problem is it's a net negative. But it sounds like you're worried about, you know, the hospitals having to cover losing their 1% of their profit that they make for what they're charging everybody. It's ridiculous for their pure profit. So you, you guys are just looking out for the hospital. The lobbyists have been into your pockets big time. Trying, We don't want this government in here because it's going to hurt our 1%. Well, yeah, I, you, from the you should check our, you can always yes. look at our finances <laughs> and uh, um, CFS, what's the example? CFIS. CFIS. Yeah, Campaign Finance Information System. Yeah. So you can always look and see who gives yeah. us money and who doesn't. Well, what I'm saying is you won't find anything that I'm getting. In general, that. They're after. I pay for most They're of in their money. pockets big time. Well, it's all about math to me. And they're not, I mean, for profit businesses aren't going to willingly take a loss. So what happens is, is that when you kind of try to hit the hospitals and try to make them pay the difference, they just increase the cost of everything else. So it just well, ends up increasing so everybody else. So they've been doing that But they, but years. Years. The point is they, they always do. Whether, just, whether yeah, that's yeah. caring for it's a, so a homeless population or, or anybody that, that doesn't pay that uses the emergency room as primary care because they can't be turned away, it, hospitals already write that off and that's why the everybody else's rates through, through insurance go up. So Medicaid would cover that hole. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. No, that's the, the, the hospitals <laughs> lost it. You know, used to get federal funds for their losses for unreimbursed care. Well, in Wisconsin, with cynical Republicans, you know, they, now they're not getting reimbursed for their their care that they're giving out for free when they could be getting it through this Medicaid expansion. Oh, 
you know, it's... Well, that makes sense. Plus, the, under the Medicaid expansion, the reimbursement rates that providers are higher. I don't know that discussion came up earlier. Um, it's, you're leaving money on the table. It's foolish just because you want to deny people health care? I, I don't get that. Who wants to deny people there was a, there was a, <laughs> I mean, serious. Donald Trump. <laughs> there was an analysis done. You're probably more familiar with this, Ron. Is yeah. Taking the federal money was going to increase the state participation in that by double what the money they were getting. And that was in terms of emergency room visits, because these people have this down to the science. They can't afford it, so they go to an emergency room for a headache because they're obligated to treat these people. And that's not what medical care is all about. And that's my money. You say federal money, that's foolish to say something like that. Right. Because so, that's coming out right. of my pocket right. regardless of where the tax is paid. Right. I'm on a fixed income, and I'll tell you what. Mm -hmm. I took a lot of pride in never having to collect those things. But I had the ambition and the ability to learn, to go to school, to go to college, get an education so that I could earn that money. So the motivation or program should be, let's not throw money at it. Let's throw something that tangible can, can put those people in a position to make more money, period. No argument, I don't care if you're independent, you're Democrat, you're Republican. You have to have opportunities for people to improve their status. Right, but if we have insurance coverage for those people, then you're not going in and making the hospital give you free care. It's but as simple as that. that. The money, no, you're, paying, you're paying that money either way. Either way. How could, how, there's no such thing as free health care. I'll tell you something. <laughs> you know day, on, day in and day out what goes on in Washington. They have a different definition of illegal in Washington than the rest of the okay, world. We're, we're off, we're off no, you listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Anytime you can manage something at the state level, at the local level, it's going to be honest, number one. And you're going to have to have, you're going to have the ability to have input into that program, plain and simple. And that's all any taxpayer asks. Once you turn something over to the federal government, you might as well kiss your money goodbye because you don't know what it's going to do or who it's going to help. They're already doing that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got a couple of last questions. Yeah. Thanks for that. Real quick. Good job. Um, it was mentioned before about lobbyists. I'm Bonnie from Mulberry Lane Farm. I wanted to put a, I will. Hi, Bonnie. I wanted to put a face to the name. Um, yeah, I wanted yeah. to thank the two of you for not taking big money lobbyist um, influence in your uh, efforts to support Wisconsin and do what's best, in my case, for the, the little farmer. Um, so, so thank you for that and continue your work and I have to leave for another appointment, but I do have a brochure I wanted to give both of you and hopefully Will will contact us about your family visit. Yeah, I want, I want to bring my, so I have a 10 month old daughter at home who is. And my kids have already been out to the farm. Right. So. Well, you got to come as a family. We, we've still got, we've still got the, the, the little cups or whatever. Right. <laughs> Our issue for those who don't know, uh, we have a children's petting farm and we also do weddings and Wisconsin Tavern League has been attacking the farms that want to continue holding weddings without having to acquire a liquor license and these two have um, been supporting us in that effort. So. It is a burning issue for us. It's either pay our mortgage or another farm going by the wayside. It's a good point. That's kind of one thing I really love about this job is that there are, this is such a diverse state already, and there are so many issues that are so important. So, you know, for very different people, for very different situations. And, you know, we can have a really cool discussion about redistricting on Monday, and we can talk about Mulberry Farm on Tuesday. And I like that diversity. It keeps your brain, brain thinking. Has so. anyone talked about water yet? We can get there. Clean water. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple hands raised. To, Let's go. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, she had a hand raised for something. Oh, sure. Uh, well, kind of on this topic of um, keeping things local, I saw an article last night about um, MTM, the non emergency medical trans. The what? Yeah. Non emergency medical transportation. For individuals oh, with yeah. disabilities yeah. and, yeah. Right. yeah. Disabled people in Italy um, getting rides to their appointments and stuff. And, um, my 
daughter's 18, so she's been in this for a long time. And so we've been through like the economy, logistic care, my MTM, and I was like, oh, they're getting rid of that now again. <laughs> um, you know, is it possible to bring it back to the county level? Because um, obviously, over the years, I found it best through the county. Um, yeah. Um. <laughs> Outagamey County always kind of mentions that too. So they do kind of a update every year um, to Andre was there, I was there, and I think all the legislators that represent part of Outagamey County, they talked about that as well. Um, and uh, it was something that they were interested in as well. However, financially it's always been difficult for them too. Um, do you know, so you're saying it's not the budget? I, don't, I just saw the article. No, there's there's an issue right now with the uh, the provider having the contract. They're, they're, people were missing. People were missing. Right? Yeah. Well, so I actually oh, I have a but, uh, yeah. So somebody had had something scheduled for for early January that even called to confirm that the ride was going to take place, and then you know we're never told that uh, their contract was never renewed at the end of December, and so. There was no ride to get her to that to, to um, you know to her appointment, and you know, so no, I I, uh, I know this is something that I, I deal with uh, options for independent living, okay. and uh, I know they have concern. We're, we're working with them in terms of trying to make some some inquiries with VHS on, on what we might be able to do there, or make sure just that we have everybody. Like, no, like no, it's, it's nice to put a face to name of somebody. Like every issue, it always helps me to. To meet somebody that actually has this issue, it's different when it's this theoretical idea versus people out there in our state. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Because so. well, the reason I saw it because the girl in the article was a friend of mine, or is a friend of mine, and I was like, oh. And then I read the article, and I'm like, because we use MTM for my daughter, and I was yeah. like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know this was the happening. Didn't throw her on the bus too bad. What's that? Oh, the article didn't. Uh, oh no, but, but she missed a issue. couple rides to the appointments, and she's in a wheelchair.
and public perception that you mentioned, uh, getting the perception that, uh, especially because the DNR has been decimated, and we need the, you know, natural resources is what we've been known for. We are the land of sky blue waters, and now our waters of many people, and, and I'm concerned about children especially. Drinking water that might have lead in it, drinking water coming through, uh, you know, with manure in them, you know. Yeah. The DNR's uh, not been able to enforce the laws we have, and, and to put our kids at risk. Our kids here, if they don't, if we have a huge poverty problem. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem with the schools. They, the quality of kids and some of their behaviors is terrible. That's another reason people don't want to be teachers. They hear horror stories about my, my daughter's a teacher, uh, especially middle school. You know, and teachers have to be, uh, take, they, they, kids can say nasty things to them and they can kick them up. And they, you know, there's just no control there. But that sometimes relates to the fact that they keep moving around to different schools. That poverty is a big issue and it has increased tremendously. And that water, clean water for children and you know for all of us, we should be able to turn on our faucets, even in Calumet County where I live, and have clean water. Yeah. And part of the problem is enforcing the laws about getting rid of manure and all that, and having lead pipes. And I know that it's going to cost a lot of money, but I think it underlies some of the problems we have with families trying to make it on low income, because we haven't raised the minimum wage, and everybody's trying to get the most money. And you know, like this fellow said, you know, some people are capable of always getting a job and they can get a good education and you know we don't have to worry about things like this but a lot of the a lot of our state there's increased poverty and we need to do things to help that now well, and it's, if it's t cost more taxes for me so be it I can afford it even though I'm not a wealthy person yeah. but I want to see the children taking here. And I want clean water, and I want the teachers to be paid. Well, they can't be paid what they're worth because it's millions. But for them to deal with what they have to deal with, we can't pay them enough. And we need to spend the money to make this state. The people of Illinois know they can come here and uh, enjoy it. Um, fishing without the fish dying. Or, you know, uh, a friend of mine went fishing and for a few days got a lot of fish, and then the next day all the fish were dead on them. And he can't even eat the fish he took. So we have a water problem, and the DNR needs to get all the money they need to get scientists back and working. And, and so the people from Illinois where I'm originally from, um, really think this is a great state for education and for the environment and for clean waters and fishing and camping. But if we don't, if we have thrown out our controls, um, that could be devastating for all of these issues. Well, these people in Illinois are definitely right that this is a great state uh, for education, and uh, Danny knows because I personally think that the Kimberly School District is the best in the state of Wisconsin, um, but uh, and I think empirically it could be proven. Um, but uh, uh, we do have some of the highest ACT scores in the country. We've got a lot of you know positive things regarding our education. So our education system that receives 51% of your state tax dollars uh, right now uh, I think is is pretty impressive. Regarding the lead pipes issue, you know, I was an inner city school teacher um, prior to going to law school, and I kind of saw it firsthand. And to me, I don't understand why the city of Milwaukee has never, because that lead pipes issue, I mean, 
lead pipes issue for a reason. We haven't used lead pipes in a long time, but they've never really pulled those lead pipes out and put in new lead pipes. And for the life of me, I can't can't imagine why they wouldn't take that issue more seriously than you know building trolleys and stuff. But um, for whatever reason, they just don't see that as a big enough issue, and I think they're wrong about that. Um, I think that they should be voting there. You know, they should have voted this. We should have fixed that issue a long time, and I think there's state contribution for sure for a city like Milwaukee, because I'm sure Milwaukee can't afford it themselves. But uh, Milwaukee should have taken that action, and they should have taken it a long time ago. And you know, my kids didn't appear. They they appeared just as smart as any kid that I met in Kimberly or anywhere else. I don't really think that any of my students were any uh, less intelligent. Now they had less content and they had less investment. There's all kinds of reasons why they weren't successful, but I didn't think that they were less intelligent because of lead pipes or anything like that. I never got that impression. But uh, um, uh, the lead pipes issue is certainly something I don't understand. Uh, I have a well, so I live uh, um, out in kind of Sherwood area. Uh, we have a well, we rely on that well. We're on the cars, um, so I definitely, and I have a 10 month old, so I'm certainly focused on uh, and I'm glad to hear that we've got a greater focus on kind of our karst issues uh, out in our area um, and kind of the impact that some of our mega farms are having on our water quality there. I actually, if you check out my uh, legislative uh, uh, website, you can find a video where we went to a mega farm that took the initiative to spend $5 million of their money to digest their manure properly. And it's a pretty cool experience. It was really interesting. It was. The final product after they had separated, the hardest part of separating uh, is what to do with the water, um, the liquid, uh, the waste. Uh, they can separate the hard uh, fecal matter out of the uh, uh, manure pretty fast. And it looked like something that I put, when they took that fecal matter out, it was stuff that they were touching with their hands and showing us. And it wasn't in any way gross. It kind of looked like you know something you might find around a tree or something. Uh, um, it, was, it looked more like a fertilizer. It looked like a final product. Really, you might buy Most of them don't have farm. digesters, right? This was an ideal. Oh, yeah. kind of situation. This was an ideal. Yeah, this is that what. That was an ideal situation, but. But the mega farms, I think, you know, at some point we have to have some. So the issue with having a quota of so, we could do digesters, but we'd have to have some sort of quota. So if you're over 600 cows, you have to do that, and you're going to have a lot of farms with 599 cows that, that, that are going to kind of you know manipulate that. But well, those rules aren't being enforced because but the at DNR some point. You know, you need to have a digester because the manure just can't. It's not like a hundred cow farm. We really, even on the karst, probably wasn't the best idea. Um, but even off the karst, um, uh, really wasn't that big of a, a water problem. But when you're putting, you know, twenty thousand cows in a particular area, you know, that manure is going to have a significant different effect on the water quality. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm glad we're taking that issue uh, seriously. I expect there to be positive legislation in that area. Um, Whatever money we need to spend, we need to spend it. So I'm going to spend wisely. Um, I, I hope we'll have a large expenditure there. Thank you. You bet. What about shared revenue for villages and towns? You know, the state has cut back so bad on uh, shared revenue to our municipalities, and we can't, you know, in the state, made it mandatory lock in our where we can't raise our funds anywhere. And our roads in my township are getting so bad. Yeah. And we're looking at a, at a transportation utility fund fee. And um, we got such kickback from the residents because they don't want to pay. They don't want to pay special assessments like Kimberly, Grand Shoot. And but yet they want new roads, but yet they don't want to pay for it. So where's in the budget for helping our towns and villages for state aid? Because you, know, you guys, you, know, you guys have taken it so far back for well, with our local roads, 10 years. just last year we put in 90 million dollars of state general funds. Remember, we're talking about general funds, our transportation funds before. We had a $90 million expenditure where we took general farms and then sent it directly to the local counties for them to repair our local roads. Now, $90 million is not going to finish the project, the project, but the point is, is that 
probably had we done that a long time ago, we wouldn't have had the local road issues that we had. The other issue that we had, you know, especially in some of my in some of my partner parts of my rural part of our district um, and rural parts of Wisconsin is is that a lot of the manure uh, issues basically they've been filling up some of the tankers so heavy that they're damaging local roads. And one tanker that's overfilled and it can just destroy an old road that's already in weak condition. So yeah, you've seen your, your village, those. you're going to all the concrete streets now. Yeah. Where all the you know, uh, urban areas because the people didn't want like some of their you can tell the roads that were damaged by those uh, uh, overfilled uh, manure uh, trucks, or manure liquid uh, manure trucks. You can even see what you see is you see basically the road on oh, the yeah. side dented but, down, and then the top of it's still hot. I mean, you get that like in my township in the ur in the urban area, not the rural area, in the urban yeah. that the roads are deteriorated so bad because of uh, developers and engineers and contractors misrepresenting themselves, you know, back in the boom days and nobody overseeing overse everything. But w what's in the budget to increase um, share revenue for our smaller municipalities that can't raise our taxes like they should to cover the cost? So if, if I could, if I could actually address that, can I have to run out to a yeah. Eagle Scout uh, Court of Honor uh, in the other part of the district right now? But um, and oh, I was going to address the water quality issue. Oh, she had to leave. She had to leave. Okay. Um, just in terms of some of the things I've been looking at doing with manure composting and what we're doing with anybody else. Okay. Well, uh, the regarding shared revenue. So one of the problems we have with shared revenue is that formula has some very serious equity issues. And to uh, give you a demonstration of that is uh, within my district, actually within my old district before this. So um, Village of Bellevue, uh, you know, it certainly uh, became a, a village more recently than the city of Two Rivers. City of Two Rivers is on the grid system, been there a while. But uh, both have some similar demographics in terms of some of the the lower, Ill, uh, lower income housing and things of that nature. Um, the difference was Village of Bellevue being incorporated later, which actually had a, a higher population than the City of Two Rivers, which was going the opposite direction. The City of Two Rivers was getting three million in shared revenue. The Village of Bellevue was getting slated for 237,000. Meanwhile, the Village of Denmark, which again has some similar characteristics, but a population of, of 14, 1,500, uh, so you know, the, the, you know, a, a ninth of um, of two hundred forty-three thousand. So clearly, there there are some there's some issues within the formula that um, every time that I go to Two Rivers, they don't ask me for increasing shared revenue. They just say whatever you do, don't change the formula. They know that they are winners within shared revenue more than just about anybody else. And if people know if they're, if they're winners, and, and so I understand that there is a revenue stream that you know municipalities have been accustomed to, and when I take that out from, from under them, but at the same time, uh, any time that you, you have different formulas to uh, you know improve the equity, the winners in the formula figure out pretty quick that you know if that same amount of money that is invested where there's a hold harmless, or just put into the existing formula, they come out much better, which is why I think the legislature has looked at general transportation needs and increasing that as a more equitable way of targeting relief to, uh, or targeting aid to, to local government. Now, it hasn't gone up nearly as much as, as what I, that's one of my complaints that I have said session after session is, you know, as we increased overall transportation spending, the proportion of that that went to local government has, has decreased. Yeah. That, that we, we have put more into the mega projects. We have, and, and so that that is one of the things that I, I really kind of honed in on. So I actually had a meeting earlier this year with Governor Evers, with uh, Craig Thompson, his designee for transportation, as well as uh, Alberta Darling, who's the Senate co-chair of the Finance Committee. And the first thing I talked to all three of them about was local road aids. And basically, now Governor Walker had proposed a series of, of local road aid increases last year. He was on the campaign trail. But he was talking about maybe an increase of 
dollars per mile road um, for towns, which which the town association was was happy with. Honestly, I said we should look at that as a starting point. But when I then went and talked to, to the governor, I said, you know, can you, you know, I I'd really like you to commit to at least having this as a starting point because the higher we start, the the, the better we're going to be able to end when we get through the budget process. And I think you know, in terms of wanting to make sure that our transportation dollars are spent effectively is knowing that, I mean, our road dollars can be, you, you buy more road at the local level than when you get state and federal mandates attached. And the, 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 it, it just, it's fact. And it's one of those issues where um, I really want to see that money go for, for local roads. Uh, unfortunately, what the governor proposed in his budget was 239 per mile, which was a third to a fourth of, you know, what the governor had proposed, what Governor Walker had proposed. And so my, my focus is still going to be saying, to the extent that we are going to have additional revenue for transportation, which I very much support, I want to make sure, though, that we get that to the local roads that we all travel and not just the political mega projects, which, you know, Southeast Wisconsin is important, too. But the, but the, so you, you, look at, you, look at, you look at one of those mega projects spread across the rest of the state and what that could do for rehabbing local roads that have a, a very delayed schedule. Kind of, yeah. Uh, so, well, once you start a mega project, how do you not finish it? That's the other issue, and that's the other financial kind of conundrum is, is once, once you got this project, I mean, you have to make these financial decisions, you know, but if these projects are 10 years or 15 year projects, I mean, you don't really know where your finances are going to be in 10 to 15 years. I mean, it might sound like right now you can afford it, but you find out six years later you can't afford it. But that's so kind of the other problem. Is, how do you finance it? I, I saw Everett's proposal to put a, uh, in, a gas tax index to the CPF, CPU. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's a built in tax increase. Right, that's you know. That's right. That's well. right. But yes. you've got to pay for the road somehow, right? Absolutely. You but use them, you right? You cannot do it like oh, yes. the president's doing. No, that's, that's a yeah. Yeah. automatic tax increase. That's there for everybody. Okay, you tell, you, you tell the, the contractors. You tell the suppliers not to keep increasing their amount of money that they require to do these projects, right? But nobody does. Based on their cost. But no, 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 no. Well, based on their cost. Well, you can't afford that. The, gas is, the cost of gas and the price of gas is not driven by an index. 